So, uh, so far we have, we have been hearing a lot about low-code integration. So it's time to hear from industry experts and our customers on what they have to say about low-code integration. So I'll be moderating this panel. I am Surudana. I am Director of Engineering at WS2, currently leading the WS2 Micro-Integrator product team. So we have a distinguished panel today. Uh, on right, we have uh, Srinivas uh, Balaji. He is a VP Engineering at Trimble Transportation. He has over 15 years of experience uh, in cloud computing and software development. So he has been working with WC2 for nearly 12 years. So he's uh, more than a customer for us. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. So next we have uh, Inacio Dantes, uh, who is leading the uh, uh, heading the technology and data science at New Energy of Brazil. So he also got uh, 15 years of experience in the domain. And then we have Nadisha Gamage. He's a solution architect. Uh, at WSO2, he is currently leading uh, solution architecture for the APAC region at WSO2. Uh, again, he has over 15 years of experience in the IT industry and he has been working uh, with uh, different kind of integration projects over the years. So, yeah, so that's about the panel we have today. So to get, to kick start the panel, so let me uh, uh, ask a quick question from each of you on your experience on low-code integration. So starting from Balaji, so uh, in Trimble Transportation, how you have used low-code integration to uh, accelerate your digital transformation journey? Yeah, <clears throat> so firstly, having the session after like two great sessions of demos on what we can do with no code was really good. I've really not seen um, practical application of no code or low code um, like that, right? So that those were like two great sessions. And uh, before I start, I have my mentor in the room, Prakash Iyer. <laughs> so he did talk about 15 years of cloud computing. So he taught me everything on cloud and we have been working with WSO2 for a very long time. So thank you for being here. Uh, so coming back to the question, so how do we <laughs> enable no code or low code within Trimble Transportation? So what we believe in transportation is how do we modernize the journey for our customers? And when we talk about customers, we, we are serving three personas of customers, which is uh, carriers, brokers, and shippers. And integration becomes a very, very important part of what we do for the customers, how we add value for our customers, and how do we bring partners to actually help integrate these ecosystems. And at this point, we are barely uh, at a starting phase, like using Salesforce Lightning for uh, most of our uh, uh, low-code integration. So as a developer myself, no code really scares the crap. <laughs> so <laughs> low-code is something that we believe in. And it also goes to the persona of the user that we use this with. For example, if we are having a partner who is integrating uh, uh, to a database. So we have systems which are uh, 15 to 20 years old code, and these systems, the integration means having a stored procedure which is interacting with an application which is written and deployed by a, a partner, third-party partner. So I think we had like a great question in the last session on how do you um, lift like what you write on the database. So that's really something that I, I want to replace with the low-code alternatives, right? So which can either be um, connect to systems and how do we have various data models that we connect to and how do we have version control, documentation, and maintainability and when we own the software or like the solution for our end customers. Yeah, that's really interesting. So getting into Nadisha. So you have broad experience among different industries and working with different customers. So how do you see and how, what are the differences that you see in people using low code in various industries and in various companies? So if you take low code from an industry point of view, it's, it's a good. common recurring theme, right? Every, every organization wants to use low code to some extent. Uh, to improve the developer experience, to make things, build things faster. 
So it's a very common thing that you see across industries. But if you take from company size point of view, uh, smaller companies tend to adopt low code faster compared to large organizations because it gives them an inherent advantage in terms of building things quickly. Whereas if you take a large bank which has a 200 uh, engineer team on IT, your adoption of low code is slow and there's resistant to it as well. But if you take a five person uh, smaller organization, adoption becomes very fast and low code becomes no brainer for them to build some new technology and get it out sooner. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something that we've seen. From an industry point of view, uh, we see, um, at least in APAC, we see banks are quite slow to adopt low code because there's already, already there's some level of technical debt that they they are stuck with. But if you take uh, emerging, in, in the financial industry, if you take a FinTech, on the other hand, they are more, uh, they are more keen to adopt low code kind of development, for, especially for integration. That's what we've yeah. seen in the APAC region. Right, thank you. So coming into inertia, so uh, you have been uh, doing integration using mostly using code, and you recently start to using low code in a project, right? Yeah. So how you see uh, the difference? So what are the advantages that you see in using low code over code, and what, what are your views on that? Good question. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. And the uh, power utilities company in Brazil are a complex area. And we are regulated and we have uh, a lot of rules for these jobs and uh, service that we need to deliver. And uh, from 2020 to now, I'm leading an R&D project that is a digital transformation focused on customer experience that we need to deliver a lot, a lot of products and platforms like CRM, from Salesforce, market automation, mobile apps, and other solutions for our customers. And uh, we have the API manager to integrate all these things, but we have a, this kind of solution that we can use low code and pro code because we can do that. For my, for my opinion, uh, I think we need to use the both methodologies because it's better for the users. Uh, I mean, from the business area, and my people know how to code, write a code, or how to, how to use the, the low code to, to develop some products. Then the low code we can use to deliver some prototyping. That's easy to, to use in deliver some products like that. But to complex products, we need to use the code. It's the way that we need to deliver the right product to the, the sector or these areas, these business areas. Then I think both methodologies work together will be better than one, one, just one. Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. So you are proposing a hybrid approach, right? Using yeah. code and low code together. So in fact, uh, WS2 vision on integration is getting aligned with your suggestion as well. So we have products for covering low code, pro code, so we have Ballerina for pro code and micro integrator for low code. So we are in the same page actually. So Nadisha, what do you think about uh, having a hybrid solution? Yeah, I think um, I'm also with Inasu in terms of how people adopt. You, know, you, you can't, you can't uh, build all your integration logic using low code. Uh, probably you can cover 80% of it, but that for that rest of the 20%, you need pro code to build that complex logic. Um, so definitely low code doesn't mean that pro code or writing actual code goes away. It just means that most of the work that you previously uh, did via coding becomes uh, drag and drop and you do it through tooling. While that's 20% of the workload, you still have to write it by yourself. Yeah, right. So uh, Balaji, so uh, can you remember a specific instance that at Trimble Transportation where low code make a significant impact in the project that you are working on? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go back to the same uh, methods that was being explained, right? So what, what we did within Trimble as a whole is uh, we started off with the common layers of what we had to write uh, code and deploy it for a product. So it, it, it starts with identity authorization, API management, and we wanted to have this as like a platform. 
And again, so we were doing this for over 10 years, so it is definitely a platform. So let's not come back to our platform-less discussions we have been having since morning. <laughs> so we did have a platform, and we did have WSO2 as uh, the most important parts of uh, the platform components. So when we talk about pro code and no code, right? So the pro code version is more in terms of what does our end customer need? So what are functionalities that the end customer need? So I'll give you one example. So ELD was a mandate for any trucks and for any transportation enterprise customers. So that is actually like a pro code problem. So where we have to write a lot of logic and it's actually a truck passing through each state which has like different uh, uh, compliance standards to be followed. So that is like a pro code problem for me. And the no code is about how do we authenticate a truck? How do we authenticate a driver as driving a truck? And how do we say if there is like a carrier taking a, a load from one lo source to destination if, and if it is the right destination? How do we track ETA for this? So all these can actually be the low code alternates, right? So which comes from the platform. So we are pushing data from uh, these use cases back into the platform and the low code can actually pull, provide data when we need this through one call. So that is actually a practical application, but when I really look at a graphical representation of how do we connect this, we have not done it in Trimble, and I really appreciated the demo I saw. Right. Okay, how about you, Inashu? Do you remember a specific instance that made yeah. a huge impact? Yeah, we have some case that use the local integration. Uh, we built a Azure platform for Azure platform machine learning design to build all these products that we have. And we have a use case called outage alerts that we can send some message to the customers, inform the, the outage that they have in this area. And uh, we use this Azure machine learning design to draw all the, 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 the workflows that connect to the technical system that they have this information about the outage. And we can create the all models to analyze the information and integrate with the market automation to send this for our customers. Okay. Then you can create something that could create value for the customers in the company because this information is good for our customers today. Then uh, I believe and we use this every day, we can see that we, when we use the low code integration, we accelerate the process for prototyping the, the, the first step. And we can write the code to the complex case that I said to, to do a fine, fine turn in this code and uh, the process in the product too. Okay. Nadisha, do you have anything to share on that with your experience? Yeah, so we, we work with an uh, insurance aggregator in Malaysia, who's a, again a startup and had a very smaller development team uh, to do the development. So what they did was they, they upfront, you know, jumped on the low code approach of doing or solving the problem of integration. And, and related to what Balaji was saying, so they, they identified some of the common characteristics of different insurers that they can reuse. And from an integration point of view, what they did was they used low code to solve those problems. That, that was almost 80 to 90% of your integrations. And there were these 10% of integrations that were custom, mm -hmm. that you can't really represent in a low code logic. You had to write code, even Java or Node.js mm -hmm. or any other language. So those things, they write, wrote it as code. They didn't, they didn't want to take that and you know, try to tackle it with low code. But then they had a clear segregation and, and solved it through pro code. So that's where you, know, you could essentially have hmm. both, both the practices yeah. uh, working together. Yeah. So in terms of uh, customer experience enhancement, so Trimble has its end customers. How the end customers are benefited from using low code inside Trimble uh, implementations? So with implementation per se, so when I look at an end customer and look at uh, how customers are getting value from uh, low code, it's time to market. So how do we release code much quicker? And with low code, what we have done is we have taken test-driven development to, uh, to the next level by, we, we just have like test scripts, which is, 
within a TypeScript framework, which actually gets implemented when there is a check-in from a dev. So when we have CI reports from our uh, Jenkins instance, it actually shows like what are the test scripts that have failed, and then we take it back into the DevOps pipeline. So that way, so with the transportation management system, so which is a ERP for transportation, we have different ways by which different customers deploy the software. So testing is like a never-ending process, right? So we, we, we reduce the number of, I can say this is AI, but I would rather say it is like low code where uh, we can just deploy the um, TypeScript scripts that we have like in our CI pipeline. Yeah. And this actually tells us like, okay, whatever you wrote code for, it just checks the box for like three of the uh, requirements that is in a particular sprint. So that actually is one prime example. The second one is with um, how we help our customers. So using the software, so for a software as complex as what we have, using the software required at least 500 pages of documents which we provide to customers. And doing like low code, uh, um, so we had post engineering development team so which can actually define what was coded, so to show like a GIF representation of a specific feature. So this was actually presented to the customer through our support portal, and they could actually see, okay, this is how you use this new feature. Because end of the day, like the customers who we serve are dispatchers who are really not trained so much on like using uh, web-based technologies, and if there is like a dot in which I embed uh, name of the company, they'll not know where to find it. Yeah, thank you. So, coming back to Inacio, so you are someone who started recently, and what are the challenges you are facing right now on uh, getting think, into low code? I think the challenge that we have nowadays is the first one is the customization limitation. Uh, we have some tools that are prepared to, to do low code, but they have a lot of limitations, features and functionalities. That's a problem for somebody that don't know to write code because they you will be limited in this kind of thing. They need to use it like what they have, but they don't know write the code. Yeah. Another limitation that we have, I think, in my case, it's the integration complexities. Because uh, in a power utilities company, we have, uh, I can say, uh, a decades of legacy tech and uh, data structures that is so complex with all information that if we use low code just to integrate without code, it could be a problem too. Then it's important to know how to write a code. And uh, find people who like just to use low code, I think it's a little mm -hmm. bit difficult today. And normally the people know, oh, I prefer to write some code, that's better because it's fast, but low code could, be, could accelerate this kind of thing, this permutation, the innovation, and everything that you can do for the first time to, to get ready and to get the product to time to market and see if it's going to, to be better or not. Mm -hmm. Then after that, you do the, the fine turn into uh, create some good products to use in the future. But yeah. I think this guy, in this case, that's the, the, the challenge that we have today. Yeah, that's so, so what do you think about the new additions that we are doing for our products, uh, like bringing AI into the table and the enhancements that we are doing for the tooling? In that front, do you think that will reduce those challenges for a certain extent? What are your views on that? Uh, I can, maybe you can uh, say your view on that? Uh, for the challenges that what we have, I, I didn't listen too much, sorry. Okay, right. It? Balaji, do you, what do you think about uh, the challenges and? Yeah, so anything with AI, right? So when we expose um, AI to a customer, to an end customer in terms of how they integrate and uh, interact with our software, 
So there is always the guardrail problem, right? So it's like, what is the type of architecture we use? Like, is the customer going to expose and start um, having um, databases which is outside our software? So one example is, each time we try to expose like an AI to a partner, the questions we get from the industry is more in terms of the one of the major airlines um, in the North, North America provided a wrong information to a, a, their customer and they had to cancel that ticket and pay extra, right? So similarly for us, in terms of open AI, it's more in terms of how can we control this on, on like a architecture. One example, we use RAG. So we, we don't use anything beyond RAG, so there's multiple things that we can, but we have RAG and we expose only documents and data which is generated from our systems. So we're not connecting with any third-party systems. One example, when we talk about integrations, uh, we have, a, let's say, a TMS, a transportation management system, which connects with payment processing systems, which connects with uh, Salesforce, which connects with SAP, uh, to enable the entire workflow for our customers. So when we have uh, any interaction with AI and it starts crawling data, so you might have like duplicate answers. So that's the okay. biggest problem that we have. But then how do we, um, how do we look at uh, controlling this is, is based on just provide data from what we have and not like open it for uh, external systems. So we are mm -hmm. still working on it, but it's definitely a challenge. Right, okay, got it. So Nadisha, so uh, what do you think about the future of low code integration? What are your views on what is coming in next couple of years? So low code itself has changed over the years. Right? The, the, when I, 10 years ago, low code meant it was very, engineering driven process, right? I don't think a BA could actually draw an integration sequence through low code, but that experience is evolving very fast and it has evolved to a level where it becomes, uh, it enables citizen developers, your business analysts, your project managers to draw up a, a, very sim, a very simple integration scenario at least without needing to have the developers getting involved. So that's a trend that we yeah. see. Uh, yeah. A lot of tech, a lot of products, even WS2 is yeah. moving from a very tech-driven, low-code approach to a very citizen-developer-driven, yeah. low-code approach. So that's uh, that's a recurring theme across integration products, trying to make it simple. From an AI front, uh, how I see, um, I see, I, I feel that AI will become a bigger part of the uh, low-code journey. Uh, how it will get used is where you would want to do an integration and you simply uh, type out, say, I want to integrate with Salesforce to pull all the uh, customer data or account information as part of my integration, I'll just write, say I want to uh, integrate the Salesforce and pull out the opportunity list from Salesforce, for example. And then that builds the integration. And then you have your test cycles that you will do beforehand to see how accurate that AI becomes. And then once you feel that, okay, I, I'm pulling the right information, then I move it on my CI/CD pipeline to production. Of course, as Balaji said, you need to have guardrails when you, yeah. when you work with AI, yeah. but that guardrail can be your CID, CD pipeline, yeah. uh, where you test it on a low environment and push it to production. So that's where I see yeah. um, uh, this low code will go in the next five years. Yeah. So Inasho, do you agree with him, or do you have a different view on that? I believe in the same way that we have to use the AI, that's the future for that. Uh, the AI could create all the, the, the code that we have, but we need to have somebody to check this code. Because in the first moment, the AI is learning how to create that, and we need to check if everything's okay to put, to put into production this product or this code. And uh, there are some things that we need to, to know about the risks, uh, the security risks. We need to understand if the code is prepared to deliver some uh, security for the product or the, the, the solution that we have before putting this in production. Then I think the AI could help and it will help in, in short time, in short term. But I think we need to have people looking and checking all the information before putting this in a production. And for the future, I think it's 
I don't know, in some years, we can imagine here how oh, Neuralink really connect with your brand and we can create some ideas, how could create some code to integration that and the AI could help to create this integration just thinking about that, not writing code or doing the things. Yeah. So Balaji, what do you think uh, about the future of low code integration? So do you have the same opinion or a different view? So where, where type of engineering, so what, what do we um, aspire software engineering to be, right? So when I really look at this, I think the customer is moving much closer to the developer. So when, when we have an end customer who's moving close to a developer, we need the developer to be focused on more of the features and, and not the basics of software engineering. So uh, when I say basics, it's more in terms of um, what is, how do we encode the data at rest, at flight, and how do we add an identity provider? So how do we uh, make an API? So we saw the demo in terms of so um, um, we had a way by which like just ask for an integration and it provides the code. So that's, it, it has like all the common factors what, what we need from basics of software, but really not the logic that the customer needs. Yeah. So in, in the future, what I would want my engineers to do is to focus on the logic that we need for the mark, for the industry and for our customers and not the basics. Hmm. So low code is going to actually make this much easier where it might be like a module call or it can be a, a integrated uh, environment. So we saw a demo from, uh, um, sorry. Jo Joseph. From Joseph on how, how to integrate with the practices. So this can actually be like the best practice for engineering where we just uh, call for modules which are more common and just focus on the logic problems and the reporting problems. And uh, uh, let's say, uh, how do we use open AI or uh, AI in what the customer needs so we can really have customer as the centric point and focus on that. Yeah. Right. To add some information, I think, about this is we needed to work with the developers together with the business areas because they know the rules and we can create some good product to deliver for our customers. And with this knowledge, I think we will create something good for all. And uh, for my experience that I'm going to in this project, we are learning that the Business area know some rules and know how to use some softwares to, to help the, the, the IT area. And this integration could accelerate all the, the deliveries that we have. And uh, the experience with the customer and uh, the experience with the journey that we have in all the service and we design all the, the, this journey to simplify the journey will help to accelerate and deliver this product that could create value for the customers. That's the, the main idea. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you gentlemen. It's really interesting conversation and thank you for the audience as well for your views. Thank you. Okay.